So I hope everybody can uh, access the handouts. Hope everybody's able to see it. Okay, great. I'm also, I have a, a pulse on people watching from live stream, so kind of checking that out too, making sure everybody can hear. <coughs> so good morning, everyone both here and watching on live stream. I'm very glad that we can all meet to think about the Dharma today. And as you may know, uh, I have never done something like this before, uh, where we have this type of formal setting. And so um, I hope you'll excuse me if I'm not too good at it. And I also have a bit of performance anxiety. And so that's why I may read off um, my iPad and things like that because I'm not too good at uh, improv just yet. So <coughs> from my side, I'd like us to be relaxed and able to speak with each other. Um, I'd like us uh, to use uh, discussion and to think about important questions together. And so please, when the time comes, I hope that you'll be inspired to participate because there's a bit of participation built in. Um, and I've prepared an outline that can help to guide our studies, and this helps me to stay on track, and also gives us some information that should be helpful now and later on. And also the, um, the online one has a lot of uh, hyperlinks, so if you click on it, it should take you to more information, which will uh, tell you more than I can tell you. So approach, if the, uh, ap apologies, if this approach seems foreign, especially for a Dharma talk, um, but a lot of my Buddhist studies have been in Western institutions, and so, uh, I'm very used to outlines, handouts, and syllabuses, so that's what I kind of rely on. And so, uh, before I jump in, I would like to thank you all uh, for taking part in this, because in trying to teach, I've learned a lot about what I don't know, and so therefore, 
uh, my growth is dependent and interconnected with you. And so thank you very much for helping me. Okay. So uh, before we engage in Dharma activity, we should make sure that we have the proper motivation, and that is the vast motivation of bodhicitta. So uh, if we all could, please think, all sentient beings without exception have been my kind parents, and these parents long for happiness, but they do not know how to engage in the causes of happiness. They do not want to suffer, but they do not know how to abandon the causes of suffering. And so in order to free them from the cycle of suffering, I will now listen to the sacred Dharma in order to accomplish their benefit. I will do this for all sentient beings who have all been my kind parents and establish every one of them at the state of a fully enlightened Buddha. All right, great. So recently at KPL, there's been a lot of stupa activity. Last Saturday, July 10th, we had the ceremony for Bhada Rinpoche's relic stupa, which you can also see over there in the Guru Rinpoche room, and there's pictures online. And also our lamas here, Lama Tatop and Lama Nima, uh, they have been helping with the new stupas at Karma Texan Cholin in New Jersey. And also here at KPL, we're interested in building the traditional set of eight stupas on our grounds. And so also last Wednesday, July 14th, was the Buddhist holiday Chokor Duchen, or the celebration of the Buddha's first turning of the wheel. And so, as a gateway into our discussion, I thought we might look at the stupa of many doors, which commemorates Chokor Duchen and is adorned with four, six, eight, and 12 doors <coughs> on its four steps that represent the first teachings the Buddha ever gave, which are the Four Noble Truths, the Six Perfections, the Noble Eightfold Path, and the Twelve uh, Links of Interdependence or dependent origination. All right. So as you all may know, the Buddha attained enlightenment in Bodh Gaya under the Bodhi tree, uh, somewhere between the fourth to fifth century BCE. And then for seven weeks after his enlightenment, he did not teach, thinking that no one would understand the subtle and profound Dharma that he discovered. Finally, he was encouraged by Brahma, who said that there were some people who would be able to understand and needed his teaching. And so the Buddha turned the wheel of Dharma for the first time at Deer Park in Sarnoff, uh, which is close to Varanasi, and he taught the Four Noble Truths. Or in Tibetan, they call it the Pakbe Dembashi, or just Dembashi. Apparently, on the banks of the Niranjara River, to the five ascetics who had previously been his meditation companion, and they became his first disciples. So uh, the four truths lay out in a very concise way our current situation and the possibilities for improvement. And I can definitely tell you about that because I prepared it, but I forgot. I have an outline of what the eight stupas are. Is anybody interested in knowing what the stupas are about? Okay, so there's a picture there that should have all eight of them. So the first stupa, is the stupa of heaped lotuses, and that commemorates the birth of the Buddha. Uh, when he was born, he took seven steps in each of the four directions, east, south, west, and north, and in each direction, lotuses sprang up, symbolizing the Buddha's love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And the base of the stupa is circular, and it has four steps that have these lotuses all around it. So that's the first of the set of eight. The second one is the Enlightenment Stupa, also known as the Stupa of the Conquest of Mara, and symbolizes when the Buddha was 35 years old, how he attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, and where he conquered worldly temptations and the attacks manifesting by Mara. If you ever get a chance, you should read about that because it's really wonderful uh, to hear how he was able to uh, overcome all of Mara's um, demons and uh, so forth. Then uh, the third one, as I uh, just explained, is the, um, the stupa of many doors. And so that there would be the third, and it's got those, those four sides with the four, six, eight, and 12 doors in it. Then the fourth one 
is the stupa of descent from the god realm, and that's when the Buddha was 42. He spent a summer retreat at Tushita Heaven with his mother, who had been reborn there. In order to repay her kindness, he taught the Dharma to her, and therefore the stupa has a staircase that represents his return to earth from the god realm. The fifth is the stupa of great miracles and represents the various miracles the Buddha performed when he was 50 years old. According to legend, he overpowered Maras and heretics by engaging them in intellectual arguments and also by performing miracles. Um, at the time when, when Buddha was teaching the Dharma, Buddhism was just starting because he was the founder. So there were naturally many other religions uh, at the time. And so there may have been um, disagreements and so forth. And so they had debates. Number six is the stupa of reconciliation. And it commemorates the Buddha's resolution of a dispute among the Sangha. And um, therefore, this uh, oh, this reconciliation took place in Magda, and therefore the stupa has four octagonal sides, and they're all, uh, and those octagonal sides are equal. And there's four of them. Then uh, the seventh stupa is called the stupa of complete victory, and uh, this was when uh, the Buddha increased his lifespan by three months at the request of his students. It also represents how he was able to transmit the entirety of his teaching uh, within his lifetime. It has only three steps, therefore, and they are all circular and usually unadorned. And then the last of the eight stupas is the stupa of nirvana and commemorates the parinirvana of the Buddha at uh, 80 years of age. And it symbolizes his complete absorption into the highest state of mind. It is bell-shaped and usually unadorned. And of the eight, I think it's the most noticeable because it doesn't have any steps. It's the one that looks really different. Great, so those are the eight stupas. Okay, so on the first step of the stupa of many doors, uh, there are four doors. And those four doors represent the four truths uh, that lay out in a very concise way our current situation and the possibilities for improvement. And so the first of the four truths is the truth of suffering. And that is that all existence is suffering, that suffering is everywhere, inescapable, and an intrinsic characteristic of existing within samsara. The Buddha saw that our life is a struggle and one in which we cannot find ultimate stable happiness or satisfaction in anything we experience. So to clarify, there are three types of suffering. One is the suffering of suffering or feeling physical harm, such as the pain of birth, old age, sickness, and death. It's also the pain of aging and injury, which I'm sure we've all felt many times and will continue to feel. Then number two is the suffering of change, when you meet with circumstances that cause you pain or when circumstances you like change against your will and you cannot stop it and thus you feel pain due to that. Then there is all pervasive suffering, which is the unavoidable suffering that comes from being composed of the five psychophysical aggregates that are the basis of self grasping. These are often called the skandhas and um, to clarify, they are form, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness. So um, what do I mean by this? I mean all our senses through which we experience the world, including our sense of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, perception, thoughts, emotion, and consciousness form the basis of our existence or more or less how we experience the world. Everything we come into contact with is filtered through them, and based upon that, we make many judgments and misjudgments. We begin judging things as good or bad in relation to the self that is formed upon these aggregates, and they in turn make us feel justified in the notion of a self that we often cherish more than others. Therefore, all our present experiences, whether enjoyable or not, are in some way contributing to our future suffering because they are enabling us to engage in attachment, aversion, 
more and more. So therefore, the Buddha said, the suffering of being conditioned is not apparent when it arises, remains, or ceases, but is still the cause of suffering. Since every aspect of our conditioned existence brings with it the potential for future suffering, we call this the all-pervasive suffering of conditioned existence. This is the type of suffering that exists even in moments of happiness, which is why we hear statements like, on the needle point of samsara, there is never any happiness. So, <laughs> the first question I'd like us to consider and answer together is, how do we see the truth of suffering manifest in our own lives? Why do we think the Buddha chose to, cho to teach the truth of suffering to be his very first teaching? So I'll let us all think about that. And I'd be really interested to hear from everybody. I hope also people uh, online can contribute. Uh, maybe we can check um, the live stream, the YouTube comments. If you guys would like to send your answers to the YouTube comments, that's fine. I'll repeat the question. How do we see the truth of suffering manifest in our own lives? And why do we think the Buddha chose the truth of suffering to be his very first teaching? I'll give us all some time. I think we might have a microphone. Is that right? Don't worry, I have an answer too. As far as the latter part of that question, why do I think he taught the uh, truth of suffering first? Mm -hmm. I believe it was um, to get his five meditation buddies to think outside the box because we're very used to trying to make things work in this kind of uh, inherently flawed system of samsara. So to, to take that whole system that we continually try to fiddle with and, and kind of tag it as uh, not working, mm -hmm. not, a good, not a good system, a previous system, then I, can th I think then you start to think outside the box of that limited um, view of things and kind of expand uh, the possibilities of, of thinking. Great, definitely. That just came to me. Yeah. We also have some questions from the internet, too. Oh, okay. oh answer, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. That was great. Sudama said, um, we experienced the suffering of no audio earlier. At the beginning, there was <laughs> audio difficulty. <laughs> now the audio is clear. He said the suffering of no audio. They <laughs> couldn't hear online. <laughs> but now everything's clear. And he said uh, also that suffering is basic and relatable, and hence the first teaching. And then Norjan Lamo said, the truth of suffering is manifesting for me right now in a sprained shoulder. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Buddha chose this truth because it's something everyone experiences. It's the core of the human experience. Mm. 
Michael Grava, because I unfortunately don't go a day without it. Hildy says, helping aging parents brings up the truth of suffering of old age and the nearness of death for them and for us. And I'll do one more from Pascal. Perhaps because suffering is experienced by anyone, regardless, and anyone can relate to it. Uh, for me, a particular way that the truth of suffering manifests is that in the winter I'm too cold and then in the summer I'm way too hot and uh, even when it's just right like in fall and I'm really comfortable uh, I'll just find something else to complain about or be uncomfortable about um, and again I I was on the I thought similar to, similarly to a lot of the other people answering that suffering is just so relatable so mm -hmm. that was why it might be the first teaching Yeah, I agree with everyone, oh, too. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I agree with everyone, too. I mean, for myself, I feel like um, if it wasn't the first teaching, uh -huh. then maybe it wouldn't have be as accessible, Buddhism, I guess, um, because I see it so true for me. I'm like, that's true, and I can, like, see for myself. Um, yeah, yeah, we can just see it because it's so true for us. Like, oh yeah, I experience that constantly. Mm -hmm. You know, there's never really like a moment of like genuine lasting happiness. So then, like, what's the cause of that? I want to know. And then like, how did the Buddha overcome? So I feel like that's important mm -hmm. first thing to understand. And yeah, definitely. I think Paul was ready. Um, I'm also curious, perhaps it was the beginning of the establishment of the distinction between the prevailing religion at the time, Hinduism, which is, seems to me solely in the pursuit of nirvana, and, that, and it has a samsaric aspect, or always, I always interpreted that growing up. Um, it's kind of a departure from, you know, a God realm perspective, you know, uh, pursuit and then the reality of reality. I mean, that's just, that's how I kind of think about it. Definitely. Yeah, it's, a, it's very interesting to hear everybody's perspective. I feel like we don't, we haven't really done this style of, of a call and response that much, which is really cool. And um, yeah, it's it's a what I'm hearing is like a, it was like a first principles like rethinking of the problem, and uh, and I find that interesting. Just I don't know from I'm like an I have a engineering kind of science kind of mindset, so I like to think uh, when I keep running up against the same thing over and over and over again, it's like time to think of uh, problems from their very basic elements, from their first principles, in order to uh, solve it. And um, yeah, so I'm just hearing that. And, uh, and yeah, just from my own, you know, you asked like a, your own suffering. I mean, it's funny, like in, um, I've, I've been sick this year, I've seen uh, several deaths this year, and I, uh, old age, sickness, and death, is just a very close, um, so it's like this, this like simultaneous like gratitude for um, being close to it because in being close to it, I'm close to the Buddha. And, but it's like also uh, painful <laughs> at the same time. So it is this a uh, constant like uh, back and forth gratitude, even in the suffering there can be gratitude. Mm -hmm. they, they are like interdependent and um, and yeah, it's uh, that's it, I guess. Yeah, 
That's interesting. That makes me think of Justin's answer, which is kind of like, I think you guys are just same, same message, a little different phrasing, where it's like uh, thinking outside the box, like recognizing that there's like a intrinsic problem and that it seems to be unavoidable no matter what we do, even if we are young and healthy and nothing is really going wrong, we still find some way to be uncomfortable or uh, dissatisfied with the way that life is. So even if the first two, two truths, uh, or if, if the first two types of suffering don't get you, the suffering of suffering and the suffering of change, the all-pervasive suffering is yet always there. So even someone like the Buddha, who was like a prince and was, you know, well taken care of, and his parents tried to hide, in case you didn't know about his history, his parents tried to hide um, the fact of old age sickness and death from him. They, held, they had him in the castle, and then any, any of the servants who got old, they cycled out so that he wouldn't see them aging. And so he would always see everybody young and youthful. And, uh, but one day when he, was, when he got a bit older, he wanted to take a tour of um, his kingdom. And that's when he rode around in the chariot. And his parents, they tried their best to make sure that all the sick people, all the old people were kept away from his route. But he ended up seeing um, all of this, he saw an aging person, a sick person, a dying person, and so that is what made, it was really shocked him, because he never knew that it existed. He didn't know people died like that, and so when he found out, he knew he couldn't continue living the way he was. So, I mean, we can kind of understand, in his case, um, he never saw that, so he couldn't help living like a lavish life of luxury, as people do anyway, but even we know that we're aging and dying, and yet we still kind of go on in this type of denial uh, lifestyle. And so I think that's definitely why the Buddha taught uh, suffering first, because it's something that unifies us all, because none of us go, go even a, like a minute without suffering. Thank you, you all for that. Oh yeah, and so if I were to give my own answer, uh, which I prepared because I'm nervous, is that uh, I see the truth of suffering in having to part from the people I love due to time and changing circumstances. And I think this was the first teaching of the Buddha because uh, we may try to cover up the fact that we suffer and we may try to deny it or forget it or distract ourselves from it because it makes us sad. But if we do that, then we may alleviate the symptoms but not the cause and therefore, we may not do anything to make a lasting change. In other words, if you don't acknowledge the problem, then you can't fix it. More or less like what we were saying. So, thank you all very much for sharing those experiences and reflections. I really like hearing your voices and your stories, so that's great. I appreciate that. All right, truth number two. Next, the Buddha taught on the cause of suffering. He taught us that the cause of suffering is attachment. Attachment, as we know, is internal, not external, and therefore, it is within our control. Nevertheless, it feels as if it's out of our control due to our own habits. We feel helpless against the strength of our attachments and craving, and we have a very hard time curbing it. We want things and we don't want things so strongly that we naturally become at odds with others when there is any conflict with us getting what we want. Therefore, the real culprit is that wanting itself. So here's a bit of a story. Uh, once I was on the porch with my dad when I was much younger, and I asked him why we suffer, and he said, it's because of our attachment. And I didn't really understand what he meant at the time, but as I got older, I saw that so much of the suffering that we all experience is self-inflicted because we hold on to what we want so strongly that we're not content with accepting things the way we are and the way they are. Being happy or not happy is internal, yet I often find that I choose not to be happy. I choose to see things as a problem that needs to be fixed, and thus I'm often not satisfied, which is my choice, but it doesn't feel that way. It feels like I could be happy if I could just change certain things and then happiness would be there and I would have it. <coughs> But sadly, that happiness is not here now. And so I go on wishing and living with a certain amount of disappointment. So I'm wondering, can anyone relate? Does anyone feel 
like their attachment causes them suffering? And if so, how so? Uh, please feel free, feel free to share in person or in the YouTube chat. This is the second truth. Yeah, of course. Of course. So the question is, does anyone feel like their attachment causes them suffering or prevents their happiness? And if so, how? Please feel free to share in person. And I'm going to think too. I understood you correctly. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I believe what the Buddha says. Uh, I'm not sure I can avoid suffering uh, at all. And um, so I really believe that every day there's a time when I might suffer during the day. But um, what I have found uh, by listening to yourself and all the beautiful teachers here at KPL, um, our ways of not running away from it, kind of holding it, and then trying to see it from all the teachings, try to use what I've learned here, the tools Sometimes I don't know what the answer is. Um, if it's something I have not done correctly, maybe there's a consequence. Uh, but I must say that what helps me, I, don't, I really don't believe I can avoid it. So what I have, what I, hope to be learning here, and what I have been learning here, is not to avoid it and not to try to escape it. And I think that if um, there's a klesha for me, <laughs> it's wanting to escape the suffering rather than facing it, holding it, and looking at it because there might be something in that suffering that is compassion or something for me to learn. I don't know if I'm answering your question correctly, but I think that's what I have to say. Thank you so much. Somebody else? Thank you. For me, there's a kind of inextricability or indivisibility between wanting things or being attached to things and not feeling like I'm good enough or that things are good enough for me. So the more that I want, the more I feel like things are lacking or wanting in me. There's an uh, absence of something grows with the want of something. But the less that I want, in the same way, inverse, the less that I want to change things, the less that I feel there are things that I need to change. More or less, you know, just the inverse of that. So attachment comes with, for me, from wanting to, to have things different way and that makes me feel like not quite complete.
for me, it seems that if I uh, deconstruct a suffering, if I look at the basis of it, there's resistance. And when I accept it, it dissipates. It may take a while sometimes to dissipate, but it does dissipate generally. That's a great reflection, yeah. Also, I see the connection to what Paul is saying and to what Phyllis was saying about um, looking at the suffering, not trying to escape the suffering. And also, Phyllis was saying how she's trying to apply some of the tools that she learned to that, to the holding and the looking. And I think that's a part of meditation also. Something we do in meditation is to look at that suffering. Usually meditation, it's like, oh, your shoulder hurts or your back hurts. And so observing that. And so in life, even when not meditating, I feel like the teachings of the Buddha help us to not try to run away from the pain, but to be able to question the pain, to sit with the pain and to scrutinize, to scrutinize it, to try to look at what it really is, what it is that is bothering us. Is there something there that is in a sense worthy of perturbing us this much? And I think that looking can help us to, um, I guess, revise the way that we look at suffering and also revise the way that we respond so that there doesn't have to be uh, so much fear involved. Sure. Um, Norjan Lamo said, yes, wanting what I can't have, not wanting what I have to deal with, all have caused suffering for me. And ego clinging, a huge problem that has caused me suffering. Bodhi Pixel, my attachment and craving causes me endless suffering by leading me to believe that there is an external world that is separate from me and which I continuously attempt to inflict my preferences on. Michael Grabau. I'm always pushing for more and scheming for better ways to get a thing I'm attached to. It has never worked out. <laughs> Linda Lee, totally on point. Seeing things as a problem, being attached to my judgmental thoughts. Mila Ward, yes, my attachment causes dissatisfaction in life. Also, my attachment causes me to have fear fear of losing what I'm attached to. My attachment did, uh, did, my attachments caused me suffering by focusing on myself. Letting go helps me focus on others instead. Mm. Those are great comments. And in a way, I feel like they were getting deeper and deeper. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that last one was great. I think it got to the heart of it, right? Uh, yeah. The attachments make you focus on yourself. And the letting go gives you more time to think about other people. Great. So I guess we can identify that the cause of suffering is when we think more and more about, um, I guess, like what we want. And then in wanting more and more, we have more demands. And then we're trying to meet those demands. And then we're kind of wrapped up in this, uh, in this I guess, quest to fill all of our all of our many wants. So that's a little bit on the cause of suffering. And thank you everybody for sharing. It's really great to hear from everyone. So the third truth is the cessation of suffering. And that is what the Buddha taught on, which is naturally the cessation of craving and attachment. It's letting them go. And so since we are the root of our own suffering, we are also the cure. While we cannot change the things that happen to us, we can change our response and we can change our own mind. Thus, the lessening of the strength of our craving brings about our release from its power and influence over our life and our outlook. The ultimate extinguishing of craving is called nirvana, at which point one attains stable peace and happiness and never experiences dissatisfaction again. Of course, I have no idea what the cessation of suffering feels like. 
<laughs> I'm full of craving and attachment, and I have many things that I want, and conversely, things that I don't want. Nevertheless, it's important to know that suffering can be ended as the Buddha taught. And so finally, the Buddha spoke on the path of achieving freedom from suffering, which is the practice of the Dharma. The Noble Eightfold Path describes how to live a virtuous life, uh, which is also in your handouts, if you're interested. And it is, uh, number one, the right view, that our actions have consequences, or in other words, believing that karma, cause, and effect exist, and that they should be heeded, that we should not think our actions don't matter. We should understand that they have a precise and equivalent effect on us, based upon the kind of intentions we have that are directing our actions. In other words, there is no escaping the outcome of our actions and we should not cause others harm if we don't want to be harmed. Number two is the right intention, that is, avoiding thoughts of attachment, hatred, and ill will. The effort to do so supports a peaceful renunciation of harmful factors and engenders instead an environment of calm kindness and aids in meditative contemplation. Traditionally, this might be understood as adopting the life of a religious mendicant, but we can adapt it to suit our modern lives and embody the spirit of the teaching, which is to lessen our negative thought patterns. Number three is right speech, that is refraining from verbal misdeeds, such as lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, and senseless speech, and this also includes gossip and rude speech. In other words, we shouldn't disturb people with our speech or uh, speak pointlessly. Not to mention, if we guard our own speech, people will naturally listen to us more. Number four is right action. Refraining from physical misdeeds, such as killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. In short, avoiding physical actions that cause harm. It may be challenging to fully accomplish this, as our living is dependent on the efforts and lives of so many beings that we aren't even aware of. Still, trying to avoid directly killing another being is strongly advised. In fact, killing other beings is believed to result in the shortening of one's own lifespan. We should try our best not to steal and not to take what is not given or offered to us. We should try our best not to steal, uh, excuse me, uh, I said that. In terms of um, the last one, which is sexual misconduct, one way to understand it is not to engage in romantic relationships that will cause harm to others. So number five is right livelihood. That is to avoid doing business that directly or indirectly harms others, such as selling weapons, animals for slaughter, intoxicants, poisons, and of course, human trafficking or any kind of what was formerly known as slavery. So I know this one gets into the gray area since there are so many bars and farms and things like that. But if we can avoid selling things that require harm or can cause harm, it would be ideal. Right effort means preventing the arising of unwholesome states such as desire, ill will, sloth, restlessness, and doubt in the Dharma, and instead generating wholesome states such as mindfulness, contemplation, effort, joy, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity, to name a few. So this is also referred to as guarding the sense doors and restraining the sense faculties. Seven is right mindfulness, that is, being mindful of the Dharma teachings and never being absent-minded. In other words, being aware of what you're doing. To be mindful is to be present and not lost in daydreams or worry. And usually, uh, we practice this most pointedly when we do meditation. But right mindfulness, we can try to uh, carry on all the time. And number eight is right concentration and that's uh, practicing the four stages of meditation as well as one-pointed meditation and insight meditation. And these are clearly having to do more with our practice. So now that we've discussed the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, 
I'd like us to meditate together for a little while because in meditation we can get some experience with what it feels like to not actively be engaging in strengthening our many attachments and habits. In fact, we can get in touch with our inner wisdom, which is always there, but often concealed by our noisy thoughts. So, let's let our mind rest for a little while with some seated meditation. Uh, first, let me give um, some instruction on how to meditate. So, often our mind is very busy and is pulled in many directions, but by meditating, we can start to take back control of our mind from all of our many habits. When we meditate, we should be gentle with ourselves. Just be aware of the mind, whether it wanders or not, and simply return to your breath. We can anchor our awareness in our breath and rely on it to hold our awareness. Of course, there are many different types of meditation. This is just one, and since we're doing it together, and since this may be an introductory lesson for people, we're going to do breath meditation. So uh, try to balance your body by being neither too relaxed or too tense. And we'll assume the seven point posture of Varochana, where we, one, sit cross-legged, uh, which is also known as the Vajra or Lotus position. And if that's not comfortable, you can sit in half Lotus, where one leg is under the other. And if that's not comfortable, you can sit on a chair with your feet flat on the floor. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Number two, your hands can be in your lap or on your knees. If in your lap, please place the right hand on top of the left, palms upward, thumbs lightly touching. They should be resting about two inches below your navel, or your hands can be face down on your knees or thighs. If you like, you can put your thumb on your ring finger and gently close your hand and place them on your knees. This was taught to me by uh, Naomi Schmidt, who teaches uh, meditation often here. And she says, this helps to keep all your energy inward. <clears throat> so if you like that, you can do that or open. Your back should be straight and held relaxed and lightly upright. Have a straight, having a straight spine keeps us alert and allows our energy to flow through our body properly. If you like, you can use a cushion and prop yourself up to however high you need. Your shoulders should be relaxed. Roll them back and down and spread your arms a bit to allow air to circulate. They say like a vulture, whatever that might mean. Fifth, your chin should be slightly tilted and down, but not too far, in a way that feels natural to you. If your chin is held too high, your mind might wander, and if too low, your mind might become dull. Your eyes should be neither fully opened nor closed. Rest your eyes by gazing at the tip of your nose and slightly downward, following the bridge of your nose to the floor. The reason we don't close our eyes completely is to prevent slipping into the dream state. We're trying to be awake and aware of our mind. Next and finally, touch the tip of your tongue to the top of your mouth on your upper palate just behind your front teeth. Your jaw and your mouth should be relaxed with your teeth slightly apart and your lips lightly touching. And in this meditation, we'll be watching our breath. So in essence, you're just enjoying your breath moving in and out. We'll keep track of our breath by counting to 21. A full inhalation and exhalation counts as one. So just watch your breath coming in and going out. And if your mind wanders and you lose track of counting, counting to 21, then you can go back to one. But if you find this frustrating, you can carry on with the counting and not have to go back to one. It's just a way to help reinforce our awareness and uh, kind of like make sure we're doing what we're trying to do. Um, also, we should see meditation as an opportunity to enjoy what is always within us and we should look forward to meditation. So please don't think of it as work. It's your time to do nothing at all. No planning, no worrying, no activity, no anything. You can just be and sit. One benefit of meditation is learning how to give yourself more space and more options. It's like going back to your mind settings, like in a computer, and updating your OS so you can have more functions. <laughs> you can become less habituated to old routines and you can create new ones. Because you give yourself, I think space is a good way to put it. 
you give yourself more space, more mental space, and by that, more ways to make these mental pathways, which not only is a, a nice term, but it's also the kind of like the truth in terms of how your mind makes these neural pathways and how you form new ones. <laughs> Lastly, when you encounter distractions like sights, sounds, or sensations, please see them instead as anchoring your mind in the here and now and preventing you from daydreaming. You can use these apparent distractions to support your meditation, and you can also look at your annoyed mind. So, when thoughts naturally arise, try to observe them without identifying or following them. Just notice them and don't get involved. Even if you hear someone speaking English, don't get wrapped up in the meaning of what they're saying. And of course, we should set the correct motivation before meditating, such as, by meditating, watching my mind, may I benefit and by that, may all beings benefit. So now that we have full instructions, we can meditate together. And how long should we sit? Any ideas? Let's, let's hear some, hear some numbers. How, five minutes? Yeah. You want 10 minutes? Five, 10. Anybody else? All right. Let's do, let's do seven. Okay, we'll do seven minutes of meditation. <laughs> Here we go. All right.
so that's time. At the end of a meditation session, we should dedicate the merit by thinking, may whatever merit I have accumulated throughout this practice be dedicated to all mother sentient beings and their complete awakening. And although the formal meditation session has ended, we can still try to maintain our awareness throughout the day, but you may find that it's very difficult. I do too. So I mentioned uh, that meditation puts us in touch with our inner wisdom. It also helps our good qualities to shine through. So in addition to the Noble Eightfold Path, the teaching uh, that teaches us how to live virtuously, we can also work to increase our good qualities, which bring us, uh, brings us to the six perfections. And that would be actually the second step. So we're kind of jumping around the four steps of the stupa. So the six perfections can be understood as the noble qualities that are associated with enlightened beings. They are the basis of training for those looking to achieve enlightenment and they act as a set of character ideals that guide self-cultivation. So the six perfections are generosity, to give and cultivate the attitude of generosity and non-attachment. The second is discipline, and that is to refrain from harm and acting immorally. The third is patience, and that is to be tolerant and accepting, also having forbearance and endurance. And diligence means to strive for virtue with effort and vigor. Meditative concentration means not to be distracted in meditation or contemplation. And six is wisdom, which means to cultivate the correct understanding of all phenomena and all knowable things. So uh, please keep in mind that these do not have to be practiced in sequential order. They can and ideally would be all occurring at once. And maybe we can take a moment to reflect on the six perfections and which one we might be in the greatest need of. For me, I think I could use a lot more diligence and meditative concentration. I could do with a lot more of that, but definitely diligence. If anybody feels inspired, they can shout out what they think they might need some more of, if you want. Patience. More patience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're our greatest teachers. <laughs> we can't get away from them. <laughs> yeah. Mhm. Mm yeah. How did the how did the meditation go? Did anybody get to twenty one? No, we got yes. I I lost my attention and I got to twenty eight. <laughs> I think that means I have to go back to one. <laughs> Probably. 
I don't know about you, I probably need all six. Yeah. I'm just thinking of like the worst ones, but I definitely need to work on all of them. Is there anything people want to share? I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's on. Hello. Oh. <laughs> patience, diligence, diligence, patience, diligence, diligence. Patience, I think diligence is winning out. Wisdom. Wisdom. <laughs> Somebody's getting ambitious. Meditative concentration. <laughs> and six for me. Number six for All six for me. Oh, okay. It's a Patty Cranston. Oh, yeah. For sure. So, Linda Lee's going to get her wish. Because <clears throat> the last perfection, the perfection of wisdom, is about correctly and accurately understanding the world around us. The perfection of Wisdom Sutra, the Pajaparamita, and the Diamond Sutra, among others, highlight the empty nature of all phenomena. Perhaps the best I can do is to share some teachings on this topic. So if you see uh, your handout, you will uh, also see this excerpt from the Diamond Sutra. So I can share a little bit from the Diamond Sutra where the Buddha is speaking with his disciple, Subhuti. This excerpt comes from the end of chapter one, which naturally has many subdivisions. <coughs> So, subdivision 31 of chapter 1 of the Diamond Sutra. And how so, Subhuti, if someone should claim that the Tathagata speaks of a view of a self, or that the Tathagata speaks of a view of a being, a view of a life, or a view of a soul, Subhuti, would such a claim be true? Subhuti said, no indeed, Bhagavan, no indeed, Sugata." Such a claim would not be true. And why not? Bhagavan, when the Tathagata speaks of a view of a self, the Tathagata speaks of it as no view. Thus, it is called a view of self. The Buddha said, indeed, Subhuti, so it is. Those who set forth on the Bodhisattva path know, see, and believe all dharmas, but know, see, and believe them without being attached to the perception of a dharma. And why not? The perception of a dharma, Subhuti, the perception of a dharma is said by the Tathagata to be no perception. Thus it is called the perception of a dharma. <laughs> like that? <laughs> Never changes. <clears throat> Subsection 32. Furthermore, Subhuti, if a fearless bodhisattva filled measureless, infinite worlds with the seven jewels and gave them as an offering to the Tathagatas, the Arahants, the fully enlightened ones, and a noble son or daughter grasped but a single four-line gatha of this teaching on the perfection of wisdom and memorized, discussed, recited, mastered, and explained it in detail to others, the body of merit produced by that noble son or daughter as a result would be immeasurably, infinitely greater. And how should they explain it? By not explaining. Thus it is called explaining. As, <laughs> as a lamp, a cataract, a star in space, an illusion, a dewdrop, a bubble, a dream, a cloud, a flash of lightning, view all created things like this. All this was spoken by the Buddha to the joy of the elder Subhuti, the monks and nuns, the laymen and laywomen, the bodhisattvas, the devas, humans, asuras, and gandharvas of the world, all of whom were greatly pleased 
with what the Buddha said. So that was the Buddha teaching on how to view all phenomena. <clears throat> and there have been many attempts to help us with snapping out of our misguided view of reality. For example, as the Buddha mentioned, trying to see everything like a bubble or dream. The moon is also used to illustrate the illusory nature of reality. And I'll now share some examples about the moon found in Jan Westerhoff's 12 Examples of Illusion. Maybe you've seen this book. It's all about illusions uh, that are used to kind of explain phenomena. So, <clears throat> here is a Tibetan tale about monkeys and the moon. At one time, a band of monkeys saw the reflection of the moon in a lake and thought there was a second moon swimming in the lake. Immediately, they decided to get hold of the silvery shining disk. They all climbed on a tree with branches overhanging the lake. The head monkey decided that they should form a chain. He would go first, someone holding him by his tail. Then another monkey would grab the second monkey's tail, continuing this way until he reached the surface of the lake. They set out to do this, but when the chain was halfway down to the water, the branch broke and all the monkeys fell into the lake. Their big splash rippled the still surface of the lake and the reflected moon disappeared. This cautionary tale warns us against mistaking the reflection of some object for the thing itself, thereby grasping at an object that is not there. A commentary on the perfection of wisdom sutras ascribed to the second century Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna called the Great Treatise on the Perfection of Wisdom informs us that <clears throat> when a small child sees the moon reflected in the water, it happily wants to reach out for it. But adults see this and laugh at him. In the same way, an ignorant one, considering his body, thinks that he has a self. It is in the still water that one sees the reflection of the moon. But once one stirs up the water, the reflection disappears. Similarly, in the still water of an ignorant mind, one finds the conception, this is me. But when the stick of wisdom has troubled the water of thought, one sees the self no longer. Here, the illusory appearance of the moon in the water is used as an illustration of the Buddhist view that the self is an illusory appearance too. While we have the strong impression that there is something distinct from our bodies, sensations, thoughts, feelings, memories, and so forth, that is, me, the Buddhist wants to argue that there is no such thing. We superimpose the notion of a self on the rapidly changing complex of bodily and mental events. But this superimposition is nothing but a convenient mental construction nothing that exists there as a matter of fact. So though, those are some examples of um, explaining all phenomena, including the self uh, using the moon. So for what it's worth, I hope those examples help to trouble the undoubtedly strong grasp that we all have upon our perception of reality and the self. Another analogy is like peeling away layers of a plant. I think it's a banana plant. And thinking that you're going to get to a core when there isn't a core. Our idea of a self that exists within this body is described in that way as well. So, last but not least, we have uh, the fourth and final step on the stupa of many doors, which has 12 doors which represent the 12 links of dependent origination, which is the Tendel Yenlak Jungyi. And those 12 links are famously depicted on the Wheel of Life diagram that you can find in many Buddhist temples and also in the handout. So, uh, please see the diagram. And here we see the Wheel of Life, which is held by Yama, the Lord of Death, and the Buddha pointing to the moon, which represents liberation and the path to liberation. 
So to explain this diagram a bit, uh, we can work from the inside out. Uh, let's call the innermost circle circle number one. So inside circle number one, there is a pig, a rooster, and a snake, which represent the three poisons of ignorance, attachment, and aversion. Then uh, the second layer represents karma with its various, uh, with its virtuous and non-virtuous actions on the left and right, uh, one with a white background and one with a dark background. And then the third layer represents the six realms of samsara. And then the fourth layer out represents the 12 links of dependent origination. So the three poisons are at the root of the entire system and by ignorance, attachment and aversion, we carry out all of our misguided deeds. Our actions, whether steered by virtuous or non-virtuous intentions, result in positive or negative outcomes and this guides us up higher towards enlightenment or further down into delusion. Then the six realms of samsara are the god realm, the demigod realm, the human realm, the animal realm, hungry ghost realm, and the hell realm. And on this diagram, the three higher realms, the god, demigod, and human are depicted on the upper half, while the three lower realms, the animal, hungry ghost, and hell realms are depicted on the lower half, which actually I noticed because they weren't necessarily going in order. So I think that's kind of a division there. Then, Around the edges of the wheel, you'll see a chain of motifs, and uh, they are the 12 uh, links of interdependence, and that's what they represent. So uh, these 12 causal links are paired with their corresponding images, and they are starting from the top to the right. The first link is ignorance, which is represented by a blind person walking and this uh, represents the fundamental ignorance of the Four Noble Truths and the delusion of mistakenly perceiving the skandhas as a self. I think we have a common saying, like a blind person leading the blind. It's kind of like that. Number two is formation, uh, and the image is of a potter shaping a vessel. And this image teaches that as long as there is ignorance, then there is formation or fabrications and choices and thereby karma, positive or negative, and this forms the rebirths in the various realms. The next motif is, represents consciousness and there is an image of a monkey grasping at a fruit. Formations cause the consciousness of the next existence. There is the impelling consciousness and then the consciousness of the impelled result. And these two act as a link between two lives. The next one is name and form, uh, which has the image of two men in a boat. So by the power of consciousness, one is linked to a womb, and there the body develops, comprised of form, and then the four name skandhas, which are sensation, perception, formation, and consciousness. So that's what those two guys represent. Then the next motif represents the six senses and it is an image of a dwelling that has six windows. So after name and form develop, the six senses arise and they are the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. The next in the chain is contact, which is represented by two lovers who are entwined and it is said to occur at the coming together of the eye organ, a visual object, and the visual sense consciousness. So this contact uh, isn't necessarily the, con the physical contact, um, despite the image, it's actually the contact of seeing something, where that physical body meets your eye and then f you have all these types of ideas after that, but it's the contact with the thing itself visually. Then next is sensation, uh, which is an arrow through the eye. And um, from contact arises sensation, 
and that's whether it's pleasurable, painful, and neutral. So from seeing the thing, then you have some type of internal response to uh, what you've like uh, visually come into contact with. The next link is craving, and it's represented by a drinker receiving a drink. So after sensation, one can develop a desire not to be separated from pleasurable sensations and um, to be free of painful sensations. And so you have a drinker uh, getting this drink that he wants. The ninth chain is grasping, and there should be an image of a monkey picking a fruit. Sometimes it's a person picking a fruit. And um, that is when craving turns to grasping and actively striving never to be separated from what is pleasurable and to avoid what is painful. Then the tenth link is becoming, which is an image of a pregnant woman. And through grasping, one acts with their body, speech, and mind, and creates the karma that determines their next life. The eleventh link is rebirth itself, and is an image sometimes of a woman actively giving birth, and here we have a woman with an infant. Through grasping, one acts with their body, speech, and mind. Uh, excuse me. Through the power of becoming, which already took, per, uh, already took place, one is reborn in a particular birthplace uh, wherever the corresponding conditions are assembled. So in essence, wherever our, com our karma leads us, that is where we will be reborn. Finally, the last, the last chain is old age and death. And this is depicted by a corpse being carried. So following rebirth, uh, then it covers a lot of time uh, throughout the life. There will be the process of aging uh, as your aggregates change and develop, or all, as all your body parts begin to age, and then eventually there's death, and that's when the aggregates finally cease, and then you're back at number one, which would be ignorance. So that is what the wheel of life displays. Um, a lot of really great instructional teachings within the wheel of life. Uh, and I never really noticed as much until I started preparing for this. And so, um, with that, we've gone over most all of the Buddha's first teachings as represented on the stupa of many doors. Yeah. I'm wondering, how much time we should give for question and answer? Maybe I should ask us if anybody here has any questions on the Four Truths, the Six Perfections, the Noble Eightfold Path, or the Twelve Links of Interdependence. Even any questions or reflections, and I can do my best to try to answer it. something to get in, could you recommend something for us to read or to, a book to pursue that would get into these subjects with a little more depth? Definitely. I actually have some. Oh. <laughs> I w I'm intending to share some of it, perhaps in the afternoon 
Or maybe we could, you know, even start. But um, let's see. So the books that I have with me, I have I have Living in Compassion by Bartugu, and this gives uh, Bartugu Rumche, and this gives um, really good advice in terms of introduction to Buddhism, to marriage and relationships, and the family life, and how to practice Buddhism um, as a layperson, and then commentary on the 37 practices of a bodhisattva, and then also a very nice paragraph on the six perfections that I thought maybe we could go over. Uh, this book here is called Interconnected, and it's about uh, interdependence. And it's um, a recent book by His Holiness the 17th Karmapa, uh, published in 2017 with Wisdom Publications. And so there's this one. Um, and then this is one of my favorites. It's called Timeless Treasures, and it's by um, the third Jamgun Kontra Rinpoche. And um, it may be harder to find a copy of this one. Maybe you'll be able to. But this is also very great because it has a lot of information for people who are just learning about the Dharma. Like meeting with the Dharma, the Buddha's way, nature of mind, um, and turning towards freedom, and also about um, the guru and the relationship with the guru. So all, all of these might be interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is called 12 Examples of Illusion by I'm imagining this is Jan, J-A-N, uh, Westerhoff, W-E-S-T-E-R-H-O-F-F. -F. Actually, I read this in college and ha I haven't opened it for a while, so it was great trying to find examples. Maybe you can help me, and it's probably, you know, um, but often I'm reading here uh, about, uh, especially this, uh, hold on, something about, um, do I have it? Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, something about, they often use the word nothing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they use the word emptiness. And um, I, because I have read several things, I think I have, I, I can't say I know, but I have an inkling of what emptiness is. But in my mind, I have a hard time even seeing emptiness. I was actually meditating on it when we meditated um, into nothing. Um, I can see, you know, I can see down to, let's say, the molecule, the subatomic, atomic. I know that even within the atomic, there is things that come together. So I was just was wondering if, um, because I've also heard something about like nihilism, and um, I'd like to be able in my own mind uh, to have a clarity about nothing and nihilism and emptiness. <laughs> Is that a possibility? That's a, I know that's a, but even even in this, I think in the with the Buddha, he said something about nothing. And um, anyway, I think that's my my question. If I could, because I don't really believe it's to, that word nothing. For me, I I don't know. Um, do I need to? work on my mind with that word. 
nothing, um, because to me nothing is nihilism. But then my mind is not very wise. So um, I just thought I, I since since I have you here, <laughs> I thought I'd ask that question, and it is in the literature. Maybe one way to look at it, which might put it in a more positive light, is the lack of constructed things. Okay, I want to hear you. I'll, I'll probably never be able to get up. But. Um. First, I might not be the best person to answer this question. In fact, I'm not. But one way that might, one way that helps me to think about these words so that they don't have like um, maybe such a negative tone is really uh, thinking about them as in like the lack of everything that is quote unquote defiled or the lack of everything that can become corrupted or can degrade. So. All those things, like if you're talking about an atom or like molecules or whatever parts there might be within a, a cell, those things are, they're, they're interdependent upon each other and they're constructed and are continuously constructing each other and are always breaking down. So really it's when those types of elements are not present and it's not having to think in terms of things that are always composed or composite. So a lack of anything like that is kind of what or how you could think about it. I don't know if that helps. Sometimes I'm thinking of the rainbow. Thinking of the rainbow. We, there was one uh, rainbow that came out last Wednesday evening. And I have a, I could kind of think of it like that, you know, how certain elements come together to form a rainbow and how it really is not, but it is. This I can, I can see, but it's still, even though it is not, but it is, to me, it's still not nothing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, uh, uh, maybe there's a book I can read on this. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure it means that it's, it's necessarily nothing. I think really it's what it means is that it is, it is as if it is composed of nothing. And so, although it does appear, and we can engage with it, and even when we speak about everything uh, that has a form, like a table or each other, we, we do appear, and we can sense each other, but that doesn't mean, but there's, then there's a jump from saying, and thus we're real, or what do we mean by real uh, in thinking that? Because we and everything within us is temporary and is impermanent and will not continue. So I don't think it's trying to say or deny that that thing, that that thing exists, but it's the way that we perceive its existence that we, that we should be more kind of picky about. You know what I mean? Um, to think more about the way that the thing exists, right? because when we say exist, we, s we tend to have an idea of something like something hard or like something that is permanent that will like always, is, always exist. But even rocks, and stones and things like that are constantly breaking down. Like I think about that in terms of like furniture, like the way that tables, they start to sink and sag and even like sand window, windows which are made of sand, they start to move and get wider at the bottom. So none of these things that we think about when we think about something permanent are actually permanent. They're all degrading and they're in a sense disappearing at every moment. But yeah, great. I think I'm getting it. Yeah. I can, I can kind of see, I think I see what you're saying. I appreciate that. 
I think a part of the difficulty with believing this is that we have relatively, you know, compared to other things on the earth, a short lifespan. And so we don't necessarily see the breaking down of, of everything in a gross way. And gross, I mean, like in a way that we can see so clearly. But that doesn't mean that actually everything is constantly breaking down and disappearing because its essence is not something that is, that can remain. Sure. Yeah. Everything is relative, and then also, um, if if we can view it, if we can see it, its nature is that it is not permanent. Which is ironic, but that's the whole form emptiness like trick. I mean, maybe think of it. If the word is what's tripping you up, maybe think of like the lack of something that can remain or the lack of something that is permanent. It's more wordy, but if you put that in there, maybe it'll kind of dispel the, 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 myster- the mystery around the word emptiness. No need to apologize. Uh, the term in Tibetan is Tongpa and Tongpa Nyi. Tongpa meaning empty, Tongpa Nyi meaning emptiness. And I don't know if this might help, but maybe for me, like when I think about it, I don't necessarily feel sad. I feel more like awe because that is the thing that is the nature of everything which manifests as anything. So it's full of potential more so than lacking.
Maybe, <laughs> Nicole, you could grab her glasses. Oh, yeah. Any other questions? Bodhi Pixel asked, in the stanza in line 32, so I think, section 32 maybe. Is the cataract an eye cataract or a water cataract? Ah, yes. This is a word that uh, has a lot of variation in terms of translation. Um, it is an eye cataract or it can just be something that obstructs one's vision, like a floating Air or like something in, in the eye. Yeah. And Norjan Lamo asked, could you talk a little bit about the role of poetry or song, Doha, in illuminating these teachings? Well, I think maybe the role of poetry and song to um, convey Buddhist teachings, it makes me think about the stupa of many doors, which is that there are many different approaches and there's many different ways uh, to access and to, I feel like transmit is such a scientific word, but to share, I guess, to share the Buddhist teaching. And so um, I, I believe that Bodhisattvas make use of many different types of mediums uh, to convey these teachings. And so uh, poetry and song are definitely some uh, handy ones uh, because uh, so many people um, enjoy the arts. So whether it's music or literature or um, painting, just like all these beautiful tankas and all of this imagery that you see, all of it is trying to get us to, um, I guess, connect, connect with the teachings and the meanings of the teachings. So, uh, also, everybody has a different skill set, you could say, or talents. And so, maybe for some people, writing poetry or writing songs or singing songs, if they have a good voice or playing musical instruments, just comes more naturally to them. And so, you know, if it feels natural and if they're good at it, I think people kind of like it or pay more attention to it. So for some people, music and poetry is their favorite way of learning about the Dharma or even plays and theater, uh, dance with the chum, all of these things uh, are just ways to share the teaching. Well, then maybe uh, we'll do the abbreviated closing prayers for the morning. Or should we just do them all? What is usually done? Yeah, okay. So we'll just do the dedication and aspiration prayers on page seven. Sonam di tam che zik pani tobne nye be janam pam che ne ge ga na chi pala Si pe tso le tro a tro a sho Ge wa di ye ge wo kun So nam ye shi 
Sotote Sonam Yeshe Lejongwe Tampa Kunyi Topasho Jang Chu Sem Chor Rinpoche Make Panam Ke Kyurji Ke Panyam Ba Me Padam Gong Ne Gong Du Pheo Var Sho Sem Chen Tham Che De Dang Deng Kyurji Nen Ru Tham Che Tak Tu Tong Par Sho Jang Chu Sem Pa Kang Da Sa Shu Pa De Da Kun Ki Mon Lam Ju Pa Sho Sang Chen Ri Ke Tzu Chen Dam Pe Kang Keo Kun Du Sha Du Du Ling Ba Yi Sab Ke Me Jun Tre Bu Sang Ak Chu Si Shi Cho Ta Ra Kya Pe Tra Shi Shu Thank you all very much. So we have a lunch break. Oh, and Alex made a wonderful lunch that everybody's watching.